Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign, Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 4. Welcome to the audio commentary track for Heckle's Tale. Uh, it was for the from the first season, episode twelve of Masters of Horror, I believe. And I have um, I always pronounced it Heckle's until I saw it on until you know reading the short story. I kept thinking it was Heckle, and uh-huh. then in the short story, they I mean, but then in the in the movie, they pronounce it Heckle. Right. I think it's supposed to be German and. Uh, yeah. I think that the name of this gentleman was actually the name of a scientist. There was an Ernest Haeckel. Um, You can find him on Wikipedia. He was a German biologist, naturalist, philosopher, physician, professor, marine biologist, and artist. So he's kind of a Renaissance man. Oh, man. Okay. So there was actually an Ernest Haeckel in history. So this is our first – this is our first – Audio commentary under the um, for 2017 and under the new um, the fundraiser. Yes, this so we're delivering our, the goods right now. Yeah, one of our stretch goals. Even though the fundraiser technically is only halfway over right now, we figure we're going to have a lot of stuff to keep us busy. So why not get you know get one of these done? Sure thing. So just don't take all our money away. <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, we're going to be putting this like uh, maybe a couple of weeks after we record it. So uh, by that time, the Kickstarter will be approaching the final. uh, I got mine just paused right at the beginning of the opening credits for Masters of Horror. Oh, yeah, the white screen, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. So for me, that's 14 seconds in is the white screen. Okay, so if you're watching this and you want to sync up the commentary to the episode of Masters of Horror, Hankel's Tale... um, Pause it right the right as the screen turns white and the opening credits will start, and then we will we will let you know. We'll do the countdown and you can hit play, and you can pause this while you do that. And then, you know, you want to do the countdown? Sure. Okay. Uh, three, two, one, play. So there we hopefully, go. hopefully mine's not too loud. I'm I'm in a different uh, different location here than what I usually do. Oh, I see. So there you go, the dripping blood opening. I, I thought that this was a really cool show when it started. I saw all two seasons of it. Oh, wow. It was really awesome. I I have only seen the Clive Barker ones. I still have never watched any of the other. Uh, oh, okay. There's some really good ones. You should see one from the uh, first season. It's called Cigarette Burns. It's uh, John Carpenter's episode. It's my favorite oh, out of really? the whole show yeah it's pretty amazing i did, uh, just from the title i didn't i was i didn't want to see it because i was thinking it's just somebody getting tortured with cigarette burns but uh, no no it, it has it's almost clive barker in in its way i mean there's a, a there's angels and demons and like a weird movie thing so i'm not gonna spoil it. yeah masters of horror was uh created and uh execute executive produced by mick garris who was also uh, the director of Quicksilver Highway, yeah. um, Sleepwalkers. Remember, remember that movie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he worked with Clive Barker on The Mummy, so on that and, Mummy project. And George Romero made. is involved in this too. So he's um, so in in a way, this is sort of a, a another spiritual successor to Creepshow, like Tales from the Dark Side was. Yeah, I think we need more anthology shows like this one. Yeah, it's kind of a neat idea. Yeah. In association with George Romero, that showed up because George Romero was originally supposed to direct this episode, but he was replaced by John McNaughton because of a scheduling problem. So. And um, so, so when th- this opening here, just, just just to compare this to the short story, is completely different. Um, in, in the short story, they, it starts out with a, a group of, of intellectuals who like to meet in coffee houses and debate about things. 
Okay. And uh, there's this old guy, and he's remembering, you know, his, his group of intellectuals that he would meet with, and all the rest of them had died. And he said, "I'd better write down Haeckel's tale before uh, before I'm, you know, before I die as well, and then then no one will remember it." Oh, and I see. So it's in kind of in the first person, and it's got a couple layers of of um, of flashback. Mm. So so this was uh, originally. Uh, released in uh, the Dark Delicacies anthology, right? Yeah, yeah, in uh, 2008, I think. Okay. Yeah, so this is uh, John Ralston, the gentleman who comes to visit the Necromancer. I haven't read the, uh, the, com- the story, the actual story by Clive Barker. I haven't read that yet. But I did read the, the script and... Uh, and I've seen the episode, so I wanted to bring up that the special effects for this episode were done by KMD, of course, the company's special effects company of Kurtzman, Nicotero, and Berger. You can oh. see Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger's names in the uh, oh, wow. special effects credit at the opening. I guess he's the guy you call when you want to do zombies. Who are you going to call? Yeah. <laughs> Greg Nicotero. Um, it's funny because when, when this woman here, she's... Uh, She's going. To, she's a necromancer. Yeah. And of course, he he wants to reanimate his wife. He's a bereaved gentleman. I, I think the acting in this uh, particular episode was not something that I thought was like genius in any yeah. way. Uh, especially this guy, this Mister Ralston. I don't think he's a very good actor. But I really think that they cast the necromancer really well. He he played uh, Beast in X Men Two, according to IMDb, and I don't. I, I, I only remember uh, Kelsey Grammer as Beast. I don't remember this guy yeah. at all. Me too. Yeah. So here we go. Have you ever heard the story of Ernest Haeckel? Yeah. So they they sort of forewent the uh, the the old guy that was telling Haeckel's tale before he died and. Uh-huh. You know, because hey, Ernest Haeckel was part of their intellectual debate group or whatever, and so he's telling of an old meeting that they had where he said, "Hey, don't you know, don't discount these necromancers because uh, you know, let me tell you my story because the because the the necromancer, what is his name, uh, the necromancer Montesquino. Guy, Montesquino. So yeah, Montesquino had just come into town and and they were saying they were saying, oh, he's just a charlatan. He just likes stealing women's money." Um, and he said, wait, you know, don't discount these, this necromancer offhand because, uh, let me tell you my story. And so Montesquino in the short story is not part of the Haeckel's tale at all, you know, of his actual story. So there's a lot of changes. Yeah. I was thinking that, uh, the other day I was, I was listening to an interview with Clay Barker and this scene reminded me of something he said where his grandmother, um, he, he, Clyde Barker said she loved to tell Roy and I the most terrible tales. We're talking about his paternal grandmother. Yeah. She would pepper her conversation with stories which were perhaps true, like Spring Heel Jack, uh, Liverpool's version of Jack the Ripper. And he said that she used to drink warm Guinness. She usually had like three bottles next to the fire. And she would put, um, because she had had cancer throughout her life, she only had half a stomach. So she would put tripe in milk with onions for a slow simmer, and she would eat that along the day. And uh, she would tell them stories to Clive Barker and his brother Roy. So that kind of reminded me of this opening where she's drinking like a, you know, a, 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 she's drinking some beer by the fire, and she's going to tell them a story. I th- I think that this particular uh, scene with uh, Ern- Ernest Haeckel, uh, mm-hmm. you know, wanting to learn how to raise the dead, mm-hmm. seems really out of place in the rest of the story because he spends the whole rest of the story being horrified by necromancy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's like horrified of zombies and stuff. So he's like, yeah. Does, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It feels like they shoehorned a little bit like the Frankenstein story here because yeah. they, they even mentioned the Germans and their experiments with Dr. Frankenstein. And I thought that that was a little derivative, and yeah. uh, I don't know. Well, and, and there are more people who can raise the dead in this in this um, in this movie than there are characters who can't. Right, right. That's that's a good point there. 
Because Haeckel, yeah. he makes her come alive for a second here. We'll see, you know, before she catches on fire. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we're not spoiling this for anyone. I don't imagine you're going to listen to this movie, watch this movie with us for the first time. Of course, they're they're having a, a bit of a discussion here about the philosophical nature of you know death and the afterlife and yeah and all the equipment around. It just reminds me of, of course, obviously reminds me of like the original Frankenstein movie, but it reminds me more uh, because it's in color of the Gods and Monsters Laboratory. You know yeah. that movie directed by Bill Condon that yeah. got an Oscar. I was actually thinking we might want to do a commentary for that movie too. I think that would be neat. Oh, that would be an excellent idea. Sure. I would love to revisit that movie. It's it's fantastic. So, of course, here, uh, the professor is going to say that he would love to see him uh, give life to the dead, and we're going to see a very, very uh, graphic sequence in a bit. Do you think this is like 1800s? It kind of seems like it by their clothes and everything. Yeah, I would say so. Like the, the uh, 1800s, the early 1800s, I would say. Yeah, they don't have cars. Uh, they have carriages and they have guns. And it seems more like this takes place in America, although it's sometimes it feels like they're trying to reproduce like a Hammer film. Yeah, yeah, and you in know? the in the um, in the short story, it takes place in Germany. I see. And uh, and the necromancer skull uh, that comes up, you know, comes up later in in the short story is English, and they can't understand anything he's saying. They like they don't understand each other. Yeah. So here again, the Frankenstein reference, the yeah. electric power of lightning. Yeah. Yeah. None of this stuff was in the short story. Right. Right. Yeah, like I said, this seems a little derivative, but, you know, it, it was meant for TV, and so people, they, they thought that probably the Frankenstein reference would be more um, recognizable, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not something that Clive Barker would do. Yeah, he usually if he's going for something that's um, derivative, he tries to give it a different twist that nobody yeah. else has ever done. Yeah. Oh, here's this amazing sequence where the whole body catches on fire. <laughs> yeah, God. I wonder if that was a stunt, because at some at the beginning of the the scene, it seems like there's an actual person that's covered in fire retardant gel. Oh. Uh, so, hey, we got crispy bacon. It sure does look like a real person, doesn't it? Yeah. So, of course, he's humiliated and, yeah. God forgive you, sir. Yeah. We don't really see any, like, build-up to this, you know? We just no. see Haeckel say, oh, yeah, I've been following the German uh, instructions. But we don't really see that he's devoted, like, that he's obsessed about bringing life to the dead that much. No, and he doesn't have any real reason for it. I mean, he says like, later he wanted to, wanted to be a doctor so he could help his father. Because his father's right. dying. Right. But it's like, well, raising the dead doesn't help you with that. Yeah. And here's good old Chester, uh, the grave snatcher. Yeah. It's, you know, a character that seems taken out of the 1945 Robert Wise movie, The Body Snatcher, with Boris Karloff mm-hmm. and Bela Lugosi. Back then, that's how they got bodies for dissection, you know. There, and there was, of course, the real story of uh, Burke and Hare, who committed a series of 16 grisly murders uh, in Scotland, I, th- I believe. Oh, just just so he could have bodies for... Yeah, yes. Jeez. Because sometimes, you know, they wanted fresh bodies, the fresher the better. And they, you know, they paid for them, and sometimes they would just bring, like, really, really fresh bodies. Like, oh, oh this is still warm. <laughs> of course, nowadays, people can donate their bodies to science and... It's not seen as like a blasphemy to do an autopsy anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, hey, shouldn't you be talking to a necromancer? <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah, I mean, necromancers weren't really like a big thing ever that I can remember. Um, 
It's kind of like a literary artifice that they put in here. Mm. <laughs> I mean, there were people who claimed they could talk to the spirits on the other side, but... Not like raising the dead. Right, like raising the actual dead. You see more like... You see that more referenced in, like, medieval stuff or, like, fantasy or something like that. Yeah. Well, and in, in the short story, Montesquino was just helping women talk to their dead, you know, relatives or whatever. Uh, oh, you so, mean like a, like a, their spirits? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it was a complete shock to, to Haeckel when he, you know, ran into this whole situation that he runs into later. It seems like in this uh, adaptation, they kind of flipped Montesquino on his head because... Here, he can bring back the body, but not the spirit. But in yeah. Clive Barker's version story, he, can, he puts people in touch with the spirit. Yeah, yeah. And then it's then the English uh, necromancer Skull is the one that raises all the zombies and stuff. Oh, and here's the great Montesquino, of course, played by um, John Polito, who passed away last year. Physician, heal thyself! <laughs> oh, are you on that part already? Yes. Oh, he, he on mine. He's still talking to the to the corpse snatcher guy. Okay. Well, let me know when he talks about the secret of Zanzibar. Um, he's wheeling the corpse back out the door right now. Okay. Yeah, the great Montesquino necromancer. Now I'm seeing the right. His... Of course, John John Polito worked in a lot of Coen Brothers movies, like The Big Lebowski and Barton Fink. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's. Uh... He's definitely re probably the most recognizable actor in this movie. Sure, he's probably the best actor in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like his part. This thing that he says here that for every life that he reanimates, he, it takes a year of his own life. I don't know how seriously we can take this. Yeah, in the I was wondering the about that too, if he made that up or if it's, uh, you know, just a way to say, hey, you know, this is worth a lot of money, what I'm doing. Yeah, there's a few things that I want to address at the end of the story as well, uh, assuming that that was a, a real assertion that he was saying about his power. Huh. Yeah, no, no kidding. He senses disbelief. <laughs> So he, he's very, very, like, intimidating and very, uh, it's kind of funny in a way. It, re it reminds me of something out of, like, uh, a Universal film. I think this episode would be, have a different feel if it was recorded in black and white. I wonder how that would have looked like, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be really interesting. See, for example, here we see that this is seems like... Uh, like people that, you know, Americans, you know, settlers. Yeah. Early people. Yeah, they sure do. That's the maybe the Mick Garris influence on the, uh -huh. on the story. Let me know when he puts the dog back in the basket. He's holding it up right now by the neck. Yeah. Quite dead, Quite dead sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just threw it back in the basket and shut the basket. He's got a cool-looking cane there. Yeah. Of course, in this part, he's just speaking pig Latin. It's not really like... He's not saying anything that means anything. What, you mean Latin? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Latin is not Latin. It's just like a bunch of words. Some of them are not even Latin. So I, I guess they yeah. could have... They, it makes me wonder if the power came from the words or if it was something that came from Montesquino himself. Right, and he's just making up words to, for showmanship. Sure, yeah. This is pretty gruesome. You know, after <laughs> after this, it's hard to believe that these this couple, like, really wants to, their daughter back. You know, after <laughs> but, seeing you know, that. But that looks kind of like, you can totally tell it's a hand puppet. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. It, and do you notice how he shoots the, the dog, like, facing the audience? Like, he could have shot someone. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of like Old West, maybe. 
Mm. Maybe New England? Yeah. I'm going to ask him if he can bring her daughter back. Yeah. So she could be like that. I just keep wondering how Montesquino would make a living if in this story, not the Clive Barker story, but in this story, he's actually someone who reanimates the dead. Yeah. But wouldn't that be, like, based on the premise of the whole story, like he can only bring back the body but not the soul? Then nobody would want him to do it, <laughs> I know. right? Because yeah. yeah. you would just have a reanimated zombie, and then people would would say, "Oh no, don't hire Montesquino. That's horrible." I, yeah. you know, we he brought back my daughter as a ghoul, you know. Yeah, and th- th- that couple are like, "Oh, we want our daughter to be just like that dog." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do we have to shoot her in the head? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder what was his shtick? Well, how did he make money? Because it seems like if he went to a village and he reanimated an actual body, that people would just run him off the village yeah. immediately. Yeah. <laughs> and if it really takes a year off of his life, that's a whole other thing. You know, it's like, why would he eat all, you know, 100 bucks? I mean, I know $100 was a lot of money back then, but still. You know, it would be a lot more useful if he said, I can bring your dead horse back so you can work on the farm, (laughs) you know, something like that. But then you would have a zombie horse. Yeah. Yeah. I like this conversation here, though, where where, uh, Hinkle's kind of a jerk, and he's like, yeah, whatever. I'm just trying to eat my dinner. You don't want to believe me, whatever. That's great. Well, sure. I mean, you'd imagine he had gone through this conversation thousands of times before. Yeah. yeah. He told him to leave, and he's like, I'm going to pull up a chair. This reminds me that when he shows, like, uh, Montesquino cooking a chicken. There's actually a story in Portugal. It's kind of a legend. It involves, like, a, a zombie rooster, which is kind of like the... Um, Kind of the symbol of Portugal a little bit, especially if you go to, like, a a tourist shop or whatever. A zombie rooster? Yeah, yeah. There's, like, a story of a guy, um, it's like a foreigner was going into a village and there was a murder and people thought the foreigner did it. So they brought him before a judge and the judge was having lunch and it was, like, a cooked chicken. And uh, apparently they said, okay, you're guilty, let's hang him. And he's like, wait, but I didn't do anything. I'm I'm as innocent as that rooster is going to... Come back to life, get feathers, and crow. And so apparently the miracle happens, and the rooster came back to life, grew feathers, and crowed, and the judge had to let the guy go. So that's a, that's a real story. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, real legend. You can look it up. I mean, it's not a real thing, but it's a real, wow. real uh, old-time legend from Portugal about wow. a zombie rooster that uh, came back to life to prove that the innocence of a guy was wow. being unjustly accused. So necromancy is real, folks. Yeah. <laughs> He's really mad at him. Yeah. And do you notice that when he gets mad, he gets up and he says, well, I'm going to go to sleep. Dude, your chicken is still on the spit. Yo, know, he took the chicken with him. Oh, right, right. There you go. <laughs> Sweet dreams, young yeah. master. Thanks for the bottle. Montesquino is going to get smashed tonight. I feel like they missed uh, the chance to make a funny joke because if he said that, every people he, every person he brought back would take a year of his life. There should be some time in the in the show where Montesquino would turn to Akel and say. You know, this power is a curse. Look at me. I'm 25. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so, of course, inevitably, like, oh, the father is sick. Yeah. So this part is is, is, uh, exactly the same as in the short story. And he, because he's a student and he's too poor to pay for a carriage, he walks the whole way and camps out on the side of the road every night. Yeah, but you see, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. This is one of the parts of the story that I feel like feels forced to me that he has to walk to the next town or something because 
He's living in a house. He has a servant. He was paying body. He was paying for bodies. He yeah. has a lab, but he can't. He can't hitch a ride from someone. He can't pay for a carriage to yeah. take him there. It's like that seems like it's a little contrived just to make him go through the the you know the magic forest or the haunted woods at night. Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean that whole thing about having a servant and being you know getting corpses to reanimate it. None of that was in the short story. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that part was McGarris, I think. Here he is just a student. Yeah, I see. He's taking his doctor bag and he's walking. Yeah, he was a student of a philosopher, actually. He wasn't a medical student. Oh, okay. But he's interested in uh, bringing back the dead? Not really, no. Oh, so what's what's his uh, what's his arc in the story? I mean, what, what 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 does he want to do? He's just listening to the story. Yeah, no, I mean, Haeckel is is um, is telling the story. We, you know. So the main the, the narrator is thinking back on when he met with Haeckel at their debate group, and Haeckel told his story about necromancy. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's his, just he his, was on his way to visit his dead father, and then he he yeah. went through this awesome experience. Yeah. But he wasn't trying to bring back the dead. It was just something that happened to him, and he involved a necromancer. Yeah. This is so horrible. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, it fell on his bread. Yeah, and on his mouth. That is pretty gross. Yeah. But how could yeah, he not have, how could he not have noticed that on the walk up there? Oh, he got slimed. That's kind of a cinematic trick. It's like a, in a movie it makes sense, but when, you know, in real life you would see that from the back. It's a trope. If it's yeah. off camera, it doesn't exist until they <laughs> until they look to the side and be like, "Oh, no," or look yeah. up. <laughs> Obviously, he would have seen it. Yeah. Uh, that's it's kind of like a underneath it. Yeah. Then he's wondering, what's that smell? Yeah. Oh. So. But yeah, if his father is dying, I would expect he would try to figure out a way to 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 get to get there as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So from here on, now he's uh, now he's up against this wall and he's building a fire. This is exactly the same as the short story. Oh, okay, excellent. I mean, even a lot of a lot of the lines from uh, from what is his name, Wolfram, I think, Mister Wolfram, yeah. are are exactly the same as the short story, like lifted right out of it. Kind of like the way Candyman's lines are the same. Well, that's pretty good. The only thing I think probably wouldn't be as old looking as it does here would be the graveyard back then, because. Mm. I feel like if it's oh, the right. 1800s, in right? America. If it was like in yeah. London or something, yeah, they will have those old, tiny, like century-old uh, graveyards. But it right. seems like in in like early America, the the graveyards weren't like as as imposing or as crumbled down as this one. Yeah, that's a good point. But they probably <laughs> they probably used a real graveyard for filming. And the way Wolfram just shows up behind him is also kind of a trope. Yeah. yeah like, oh, you didn't see him walk there? Or someone would have just, like, hailed him, like, hey, sir, what? Yeah. You know. And this guy, is, he reminds me a lot of Anthony Hopkins. Uh, yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, it's like a discount Anthony Hopkins. At first I thought he was going to be, like, a werewolf or something. Because of the name. Oh, yeah, Wolfram. <laughs> yeah, the first time I saw this, I was like, is this going to be a werewolf story? He's got bushy eyebrows. Mmm, hot potato soup. Yeah, that's right out of the Clive Barker story. That's what he said. Yep, and, you know, Irish. Yeah. I wonder... I wonder if the umbrella that he has is too modern for the time of the story, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder about that. Were umbrellas a thing back there, like black umbrellas made out of nylon? Right, with, yeah, with the, yeah, with those steel rods and stuff. 
But again, this is never, we never really know what year this is taking place in. No. It's just kind of like this magical, It just like, has kind of an 1800s feel to it. Yeah. Like, like if you ever read stories. And uh, guns and stuff and bowler hats. Yeah. I used to read a lot of like anthology, anthologies with stories by, you know, Sheridan Le Fanu and Montague Rhodes James and Henry James and old Victorian stories like that that, they talk about ghosts and rats and ghouls and stuff like that. Those are some really awesome stories back then. I just noticed the graveyard looks like uh, the graves were all like mounds. Mm-hmm. I guess that should have been a warning to him that these, you know, dead guys keep coming up out of the ground all the time. Yeah, they're like these weird looking little mausoleums above the ground. Yeah. It, the, the, the dirt looks like it's all tilled up. Hmm. And they keep calling it the necropolis. Yeah. Hey, you found Midian. Yeah, yeah, right. Would would people really say necropolis? And I, I don't know. I think they would probably call it the graveyard. Yeah. Because necropolis is like a more of a an old like old ancient like necropolis, you know, yeah. like an ancient graveyard. I. And, don't and like I, the actress very much. I don't like her. the way that she acts. Yeah. I think she's, yeah. I didn't like her acting a lot. She's just, I don't know. Actually, what were you going to say? Oh, the, the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery is a graveyard is attached to a church. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I learned that from Grammar Girl podcast. Oh, there you go. Product placement for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, now I'm now I'm gonna wait for her check to come in. Yeah. Of course, there's this this tension here. Of course, because it's a triangle now. It's like, oh, it's yeah. a beautiful woman and two guys. Yeah. And one of them is a young man, and the other is an old man. It's it's again very tropey and yeah. And, in this scene. Well, and actually, in the short story, at this point, you know, when Haeckel is telling his story, that then one of the person people listening is like, wait a minute, is this is this one of those stories about romance or whatever? And he goes, no, it's nothing about love at all. Oh, wow. It's like, dude, at least try looking, using your peripheral vision. Don't... <laughs> yeah. Don't open your mouth while you're looking at her. I know. He's like... <laughs> He telegraphs it so much. I know. In the short story, he described her as like, I wanted to kneel down and worship her at her feet. She was so beautiful. Yeah, I think that's, you know, Clive's uh, attempt at making a an old-timey like, Victorian story. Yeah. I like it when Wolfram calls him a liar. Um, this this episode reminds me also of a movie, a horror exploitation film, written by a, a West German guy called Jörg But Butgerite, called Necromantic, but Necro with a K, uh, and and everything together. Like the title is Necromantic, just one word. Oh yeah. It's about a woman who who likes to uh, you know she's a necrophiliac. So that's. Huh. It's a really weird, weird movie. I I've saw that once the, in a movie festival. I've seen the title, but I've never seen the actual movie. Yeah, it's a very, very strange movie. Very dark. So, so do, you yeah, get the, do you get the impression in this movie that, that Wolfram brought him in here hoping that he would satisfy her so that, so that they wouldn't have to go through the whole thing with the dead people? Yes. Yes, I actually had that down in my notes. It seems like he's trying. he's trying his best to see if maybe a young man would would, you know, be more attractive to his wife and snap her out of that thing, you know? Yeah. But it doesn't work. Nope. No, it doesn't. Like he keeps saying, you know, we can't satisfy her. No one can. Yeah. But yeah, especially when he tells, uh, Mr. Akel is a very handsome-looking uh, man, isn't he, Elise? Yeah. <laughs> A very eligible bachelor. Yeah. It's like, dude, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to set me up here? Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. This is a very, uh, there's a lot of tension in this scene, but it's an awkward sort of tension. Right. Yeah. And you don't, you don't learn until later, you know, that she's really not interested in him at all. Mm -hmm. It seems like at this point, I don't know. I mean, you know, knowing that this isn't working, would he have maybe have kicked him out or drugged him so that he slept through the whole thing or I don't know. I guess he was trying to do that by giving him too much wine. Yeah. You know, maybe right. he was trying to get him drunk. Yeah, but it obviously didn't work. No. This is a second act of the of this of this episode is a little slow. I mean, not much is going on here yeah. except they're kind of like creating this situation so that of course, uh, Hakel would be enthralled by the lease. Yeah. Uh, but it, it kind of smashed over the head a, a lot, <laughs> you know. Obviously, she keeps looking out the window, so there's something out there that she wants to do. Mm. And Hakel keeps staring at her, and her husband keeps saying, she's really cute, isn't she? And he's a really nice young man. Yeah. So you're kind of like, okay, I get it. Let's move on to the next part of the, the story, you know. But there's still a lot to go. I feel like here they should have made her less interested in him. It feels like yeah. she almost is considering kissing him or she kind of feels like a certain, you know, yeah. thing going on between the two of them. But she should not have any feelings for any living man. Right. Yeah. At this point, she should just be trying to get him to sleep and like you just lay down and shut up so I can, you know. Yeah. He's kind of like, almost like a Lord Byron kind of character, especially with the the vest and the, the the shirt and the scarf and all that. Yeah. And apparently he doesn't have any sleeping clothes. He just sleeps in his clothes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess if he's expecting to just sleep on the side of the road every night, it makes sense. I'm just going to grab my boob. Yeah. Yep. So at this point, we're like, okay, we get it. Move along. Yeah, the the script, um, I have it right here. Um, it was it was written by Mick Garris, and it's interesting because in the opening page it says that there are some uh, different color pages, which is not unusual when they have corrections and stuff. So they have pink pages and blue pages and white locked pages, which is, I'm guessing, the shooting script. Mm -hmm. So all of this was written during October 17th, 2005, and then October 11th, 2005, and then September 22nd, 2005. Hmm. So it seems like it was written over a period of a couple of months. So he must have had this short story before it was published then. I guess, yeah, because it was written in 2005. When was it first? Uh, but, you know, of course, Clyde Barker sometimes has these stories in his office, and maybe he gave his story to Mick Garris before it was even published. Yeah. But I mean, I know I know it was published before this actually came out on Masters of Horror. Sure, but okay. uh, I think it was not very long before because I read it before I'd heard of this. I think it's funny because when you uh, when you were talking about the the body that's hanging from the tree and Hinkle is eating bread, yeah. Uh, they have a, a, a note in the script saying, this shot is optional. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and the large strip falls in slow motion and hits him in the eye. Mm. So it was supposed to hit him in the eye. Yeah. But they probably just, they just accepted whatever, wherever it hit him. Yeah. It's kind of a banging noise going on on your side. Oh, I'm sorry. That was just my uh, keyboard. Oh, okay. And 
and here we see the man cracking down yeah. after Elise left. She said, it's been a year. I got to go. Yeah. At least she only did it once a year, you know? Yeah. And in the short story, so, um, you know, when, when Skull, he paid off Skull and he comes to the door. He's like, he's an Englishman. What is, you know, you pay, you you hired him to, to service her? He says, what, are, you know, what about me? He's like, English people don't even know how to make love properly. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> she needs a German. Yeah. So there's supposed to be like some uh, howling dogs in this scene, in the script, it says, Howling of the dog drifts through the night again, and Walter takes another long look out the window. Hmm. Which is supposed to be Montesquino's dog, I guess, I'm guessing. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Maybe he should have left the, the dog behind. Mm hmm And he says here, when I married her, I was already too old to be a husband to her in the truest sense. Yeah. And then the dog is supposed to howl again when he says, the boy isn't mine. Oh, there it is. There's the noise. Yeah. I wa I'm wondering if we should put the... Uh, I guess this is available on the internet, so I guess we might add the script to the show notes. Oh, sure. Yeah. So this guy, Derek Cecil, who plays Haeckel, he's been in other stuff. Um, he was born in Amarillo, Texas, and he's been in House of Cards, which, if you have Netflix, I think, that's on Netflix, right? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but that's the Kevin Spacey show, right? Mm, it's like a yes. political political thing, I think? Uh, yes, yes. It takes place in Washington and stuff. So he's, he's in that show. He's also in Law and Order. He was in Grey Anatomy, Grey's uh, Anatomy. He's been in a lot of TV uh, shows, I guess. Fringe. Oh. I've seen all of Fringe, but I don't. Maybe he must be. He must do like guest appearances on a lot of shows. Yeah, it's just that I think he might have been in just one episode, playing a role called Christopher. So. Well, and, and it seems like everybody in New, every actor in New York has been on Law and Order. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And this guy who plays uh, Wolfram. I'm trying to look him up real quick. Oh, this is where they go. Tom McBeath. That's the name of the guy who plays Wolfram. McBeath. From McBeath. Yeah. Oh, Not beef. Macbeth. McBeath. M C B E A T H. I thought you said like McBeef. No. <laughs> he's he's Canadian. He's been in uh, Watchmen, apparently. Oh, huh, Watchmen. I wonder what, what role he played there. He played a news analyst in Watchmen, so I guess it's a small role. Um, this part, where they're going to find the dog, like Montesquino's dog, yeah. kind of reminds me a little bit... Um, Damnation game? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Of course, we know that, that Clyde Barker loves dogs, so he would never, he would never ever uh, hurt a dog. Uh, yeah. Well, and but, this is not in the short story. Right. The, the but, dog, uh, yeah. Cause it's but in Damnation dog. Game, I guess he has a really gruesome scene where uh, there's a, a dog, a German Shepherd, I think, called Bella. Yeah. And I think Mamoulian kills the dogs and then... When he shows up at Joseph Whitehead's house uh, one night, he kills the dogs. And then another visit that he comes, he digs them back up and reanimates them. Yeah. And it's a really gruesome scene. Much like I would imagine this scene here. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it's very, very gruesome. Yeah, so the, he spends this, you know, he, he, he wants to kill this dog, and uh, Wolfram is saying, you can't kill it, it's already dead. And he's like, no, that's not possible, you can't raise the dead. And it's like, what have you been trying to do in the first part of the movie? <laughs> yeah, again, true. I think it comes from the fact that they attach this idea that uh, Haeckel is a scientist who wants to reanimate the dead at the beginning of the episode, even though that's not part of the story yeah. that Clive Barker wrote. And so that kind of clashes a little bit at this point, yes. Yeah. And any other guy would just turn back and, <laughs> and say, well, you're on your own, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. So... Wolfram really should have turned around and gone home, I think. Yep. At this point. The woman who plays Elise Wolfram, her name is Leela Savasta. I'm looking at her IMD pro B profile right now. She's also Canadian. She didn't even have any uh, picture on her IMDb profile, right? No, she doesn't. I She's done a lot of things, though, but um, I'm guessing they're just smaller, smaller roles. Like, she's been in Transporter, the series, uh, Joy Light series 3. Yet? Apparently, yes, yeah. from 2012. Oh, and wow. And Joy Ride 3, Roadkill. Joy Ride 3? Yes. Never heard of Joy Ride 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she was in a movie called The Craigslist Killer. Oh, that I, sounds like I a made-for-TV movie. Yeah. I smell something natural. Yeah, I can't believe that that skeleton is ch chained up to the to the gate. Yeah, and it looks like it's just like a metal ornament. It doesn't look like a. That is so disrespectful. <laughs> Why would they do that? <laughs> I know, and they have the glowing eyes, like the red yeah. glowing eyes, like oh, I'm watching you, dude. <laughs> And it's okay, folks. They say at the end of the episode that no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. Oh, that's good. So when he fell on those mice, I guess he didn't really fall on those mice. Oh. Although uh, I recall that when uh, Clyde Barker was trying to get uh, Hellraiser past uh, the censorship, that he had to actually take a mechanical mouse oh, to, yeah, the, yeah. to the offices of the... Um, I forget the one that's in Britain, but yeah, right. Their their, their version of the MPAA or whatever. Yeah, the BC something. Yeah, um, and he had to show them how it worked. Like, see, this Frank didn't really cut through a mouse. It was just, you know, latex and hair and stuff and yeah. blood. Yeah, it does look really, really uh, real, and it's really kind of disconcerting. That is a very, very imposing scene right there. What's that? The... Oh, I think I'm a little ahead of you. She's already, like, doing it with the dead guys. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think just a few seconds. Yeah, now I'm on it. Okay. <clears throat> That's quite impressive. I mean, she is very, very good looking. She is very beautiful. I just, I, I just never understood... Like, you know, there's been movies made now, of course. Zombies have been, geez, all over TV and movies yeah. to the point where you can't even, like, throw a stick without hitting a zombie now. You got The Walking Dead, which actually can be, does the effects for The Walking Dead. So uh, the same company that did the effects for this one is now doing the effects for The Walking Dead. In the short story, well, they weren't all complete corpses. I mean, most of them were, were little bits and pieces and hands and stuff. Oh, God, yeah. I, I read an excerpt of the story where it says there's, like, a rib cage with, like, little arms and shoulders kind of crawling on the floor and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that's horrible. Yeah. So they were kind of just oozing all over her and stuff. Ugh, gross. But, yeah, I can understand why vampires were seductive, I think. But uh, as for zombies... I never really understood that. I mean, there was this show, uh, this movie that they made, 
um, I, f I forgot the movie's name, but it's about this guy who's a teenager and he's, in he's a zombie and he's in love with a girl. And uh, he's trying to snap out of being a zombie because apparently it's something you can cure. I think it's called Warm, hmm. or warm, warm bodies. Hearts. Warm Bodies or something. Yeah. And it's like, how... How does that even work? Like, yeah. <laughs> necrophilia is not sexy. Yeah. It's gross. It stinks. You know, yeah. it's got all the slime and stuff. You're yeah. decomposing material. How, you know, can you try to make that mainstream romantic? You know yeah. what I'm saying? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, there goes Montesquino. Also, an interesting thing. He says that he can't stop it once it started, but yeah. the only way that it can end is when the sun comes up. Yeah. Then they'll all bury themselves back into the ground. I guess. Yeah. Like Thriller. Yeah. Oh, this is horrible. Poor, poor Wolfram. Choke on them. Choke on them. Yeah, right. I love that movie. I do too. I, apparently it didn't do very well, but um but yeah, I think that's a great Romero movie. Oh Yeah, Dave the Dead. But that character Rhodes is so awful. He he, he, he totally deserved that. I don't Wolfram did not. He keeps talking to the doctors and calling them Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah, I think oh. um, I think it's pretty nasty for for Hankel to kill him like that. Yeah, Hankel is not a very sympathetic character here. He seems like a guy who doesn't really know. He's very uh, he's a prey to his own feelings and his own like obsessions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He won't listen. Oh, to, he won't listen to anybody. Yeah. Tell me, you bastard! Like you're the one that shot him. He's going to die. Right. Like he's going to, he owes you something right now. Yeah, it doesn't help anything. Yeah. When they show the scene the next morning, you actually see the dead, like, closing himself in his grave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of shallow graves. There's a chicken. On top of Hakel. Oh, oh, crow, crow. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. God, that's not a chicken. That's a crow. Yeah, same thing. So, hey, this guy's not dead. Oh, oh well, I'm gonna peck at him anyway. Yeah. So. So yeah. this, the second act of the movie is pretty faithful, except for, you know, it's not Montesquino, it's Skull, but, uh, in the short story, but, um... What I want to know is... The third how act does, is totally different. What I want to know about this is, how does Elise know the story when she wasn't there? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, right, she's telling the story of, of him coming Cause, back. Because she doesn't know the story of, of Heiko before she met him. She doesn't know what happened. How is she telling this to that Ralston guy? Right. Yeah. That's one of the things that fails completely. Because, again, they they mixed up the story and they try to add some new stuff to it. And it just doesn't... doesn't Wait, yeah. Can the zombies talk? Maybe she he told her? Um, I don't know. I guess. But we never see a zombie talk here. So that's kind of yeah. like... Yeah. You know, Just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Like the adaptation feels like they should have just started it like the story, you know, yeah. instead of adding all this Frankenstein stuff. And and what is, uh, when she's a necromancer and she's old, what is her name? It's like Ms. M I Z. Yeah, what, Ms. Carnation. Ms. Carnation, yeah. She looks completely different from Elise. Like they didn't even try to find somebody that looks similar to her. Well,. Again, that was going to bring this up at the end, but if it's true that Montesquino says that bringing the dead will take a year of their lives, oh. and maybe she keeps bringing the dead back, and that 
keeps taking years off her life. That's maybe that's why she looks so old. But you're right. You know, her hair is not the same color. Her face doesn't even look close to the face of this yeah. young piece. So. Again, it's one of those things. Can we take the narrator seriously? Can we believe what the narrator is saying? Because if it's yeah. Elise, there's no way she would know the whole story unless yeah. the zombies could talk. Yeah. So this dialogue here from Elise is all exactly the same as the short story. Also, this baby, I could see this baby coming a mile away. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because of the sound it makes, and that they would never show it to you until now. So, yeah. in the short story at this point, when he sees the baby, he runs out the door. Uh huh. And that's the end of Hakel's tale. Obviously, because he's the one tell he he told the story to yeah. someone else. Yeah. So he's not dead. But just this whole scene here with the vampire baby. Oh my god. I mean, mm-hmm. the blood. Yeah, right, yeah, I know. Does he have a buzz saw in his mouth? It's like Jesus Christ. That that's terrible. How did K and B think that this was a good defense <laughs> shot? I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I love K and B, but it's like here. It's like God damn. It's like <laughs> just gushes out. It's like Quentin Tarantino. Like yeah, yeah. I think this shot of the moon is stock footage. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. Because in the credits, you see that they thank, like, a stock footage library. And actually, I'm starting to think that maybe this is a soundstage and not it's, it's not even outdoors, this uh, cemetery. Right, right. That's, that's a good possibility there, yes, I'm sure. All right, everybody, act dead. Yeah. But not laying down dead, walking around like fucking cell dead. Yeah. You know, I you kind of wonder if um, actresses read the script for this and they're like, I don't really like Elise's part that much. I don't think I want to do this. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But then again, it's like, hey, Masters of Horror, you know, yeah. produced by Nick Garris, Clay Barker's story. Yeah. Big deal. It was on TV, so. Yeah, that wound in his neck doesn't seem to equal, like, the amount of blood that came out of it. Uh, I think the end of the the episode turns out to be unintentionally funny. Yeah. And I, I guess, I mean, I think I would have, I would have been okay. Obviously, they have to go back to Ralston and Ms. Carnation talking about yeah. the story, but it's like just the ending seems so. I, I think they should have, they should have just stuck to her revealing the baby and him running away, and that would yeah. be it. Yeah, I think. So. I think when they they bring all the other guys in, it just becomes like funny. Yeah. Because they're looking at him all goofy, like. Rrr. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, hanging around in the house. Why are they hanging around in the house? That's not the way it used to work. Right, and it's like, so what? She reanimates them every night because yeah. when the sun comes up, they they disappear. So why are they just hanging around all these years? Yeah, that's one of the things again that kind of falls apart for me at the end because it's yeah. like, maybe it's all a lie. Maybe it didn't take years off their life, but. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know how far in the future this is, but obviously the baby's not growing up because it's a zombie baby. Right, right. (gasps) Surprise! I wonder if she had to, like, change the baby's diapers. Yeah, for for 50 years. I, I bet that got old after a while. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, I'll just stick him on this on this wooden bench with a hole underneath and put a bucket underneath him. So the fact that they reveal the baby with the Hakel scene, and then they try to make like the baby, you know, the, the the noise here at the end, and it's like, okay, we already know that the noise is from the baby. So yeah, they pull a bait and switch though. They they show. Hakel show up instead of her revealing the baby, but yeah, 
Yeah, I don't I don't like the, all the Ralston and Ms. Ms. Uh, Carnation stuff. I, I, I think I, Ralston shows up with a baby. Yeah. I, 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 I would rather it had been done just like the short story, I guess. Yeah. So this third zombie dude, he's like the father of the child, right? Yeah. He was her husband uh, who died suddenly. Yeah, I, I feel like the tone of Ms. Carnation here should have been a little more sinister. Yeah. Instead of being... It feels like she she's trying to deliberately scare him, but but she's so matter-of-fact about this ending part here that it's like, uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, it, and Ralston could have been bringing the, the rest of the town back with torches after that happened. Right, yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. So, mm, I don't know about this. Yeah. And then we can all play. Yeah. Ralston gets top billing on this. I guess it must be in order of appearance. Sure. So there you have it, folks. These credits are kind of jerky. There you have it, folks. The end. Yeah. I don't think the other episodes had the end. Uh, I don't remember that. Hmm. Yeah, I've yeah. only seen this one in Valerie on the Stairs. Oh, you should definitely see the other ones. They are very good. I, I like the other uh, um, uh, the other episodes a lot. And like I was saying, yeah, try starting with the uh, the John Carpenter episode, the Cigarette Burns. Yeah, it's, it's really messed up. Yeah, I think you will really enjoy that one. So that's it. It's Heckle's Tale. Um, this was originally aired... When was this originally aired? It says 2005 in the credits, but... I January think... 27, 2006. That's when okay. it was uh, aired on oh. TV. Huh. So, and the episode uh, script was based on a Clive Barker story, first published in the anthology Dark Delicacies, Original Tales of Terror and the Macabre. So I'm guessing it was edited by um, Del Howison? Yeah. Same yeah. guy who edited uh, Midian Unmade. Maybe I found out, maybe I just didn't find out about this story until 2008. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to remember, it was when I went to uh, the, I went, I went there for, for Midnight Meat Train. Okay. But that was 2008. So now I'm confused. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to remember exactly when we read something or saw something. I yeah. Mean, it's, you have an idea of, you know, somewhere around it, but I, I couldn't tell you when I saw this the first time. I, I'm guessing it's because I was watching Masters of Horror, so it's probably 2006 when it was airing on yeah. TV. Yeah. So that was it for me. Hmm. All right. Well, this is our first yeah. audio commentary of 2017, and... Thank you so much to everybody who contributed on our Kickstarter blood money yeah. uh, for us to be able to do this. And there's going to be a lot more uh, audio commentaries coming this year. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, we got a, we'll have another regular numbered episode. And, and uh, later on, our next audio commentary will be probably Valerie on the Stairs. Yes, another Nick Garris um, uh, Masters of Horror episode from Season 2. So if you, if you have any comments or anything you want to say about Valerie on the stairs that we could talk about during our audio commentary, send that in to us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you can still send us like messages through Skype um, on yeah. our website. Right? Yeah. On mobile. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, we've got that little voicemail tab on the on the website also. All right. That way, you you know, Ryan will have some messages on the Skype inbox apart from me saying, "Hey, I'm just testing this one, two, three testing." <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. All right, guys. All right. Thanks a lot for joining us. Right. We'll it's catch fun. you again next time. You can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at OccupyMidian. 
Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.